Um, and we could have gone on to design a much better serial or hybrid one, but um, we would have certainly abandoned this design if we had considered its actuation space. Because if you look up this guy's actually, if you calculate this one um, and find his twist wrench uh, stiffness matrix and times it by those two rotational twists, you actually get this actuation space, and it's really far down and weird, which means there's no way you could do this, especially if you're making this in the microfab. You know, how do you get a stage that goes all the way down so that it's a very specific length so that when you push on it, you get this rotation? And then you have to have the stage go even further so when you push on it this way, you get that rotation. So um, it's a clean space, but it's so awkwardly oriented that, like, it would just make this design be horrible, right? And so, so it, it's like I said, I, I can't emphasize enough, it's really important you consider. Don't just design the flexures and put all your time in that and then make it and find, hey, turns out the actuation space is totally ridiculous um, and can't be done. And, you know, imagine if it was like a circular hyperboloid or some of these weird things. I mean, it's just like you don't want to be pushing on stuff like that. So it's like time for a redesign. Um, this one was the one we, we did redesign that got the two rotations and the translation. And this one has a great actuation space. It's just like this and that pushes directly up from below where there's plenty of space for the actuators and they can push on it. So, um, so this is clearly a much better um, micromere array design that we settled on for. This is the best parallel micromere array design um, or, or like you know, in, the, in that category, uh, especially if you want large ranges. You're not going to get larger range than making the wire that long. Um, there's ways to sacrifice range but make it even more symmetric and nicer. You know, like you could you can have the tab come out here and have the wires going over there to the grounds and stuff. But, but anyway, that, that would kill the range substantially. And they're all similar. So, okay, so, so um, just fortifying that this is a, even, you know, even more so the best parallel design. Now, there's a much, much, much better um, hybrid design. You can look up a paper we've published on micromere arrays, and we have a really slick uh, micromere array that... Uh, um, you know, is, is, is axisymmetric hybrid with, you know, three uh, serial limbs and the actuators are all decoupled and it's, it's beautifully constrained and it's, it's, I think it's the best design there could be. Um, but I, I don't think I'm going to show it in this. Um, I'll, I'll let you guys look that up if you're curious. So, okay. Um, okay, so let's, so that's, that's static actuation space. So it's obviously important to design, to consider the actuation space. Now let's look at dynamic actuation space. All right. Okay, so remember this, our favorite uh, example here we did in lecture three. And, you know, I have all the, you know, 20 centimeters, all the parameters labeled and everything. We, I, I gave you these material properties and, and um, you know, uh, and, and, and we, oh, it looks like we changed the material properties on you. We made it steel instead of aluminum, but it, it's okay. You, you could still find the mass and stiffness matrix of this and assume all the mass is in the body and all the stiffness is in the, the, the wires and everything. So, okay, now we're going to use this as a practical actuation example, okay? So, okay, so remember its degrees of freedom is two translations and a rotation. So that's T1, T2, and T3, where T3 is a pitch of zero, and these T1 and T2 has infinite pitch, they're translations, right? Um, well, if you just statically actuate these, First of all, you can take these twists and times them each by the, the stiffness matrix that you calculate for this. That's just a function of the wires and everything, right? And you would find um, W1 is a pure force that pushes a certain distance down. And by, and by the way, it, it's always halfway down the length of the flexures. It, it happens to be if you have a parallel guide mechanism with blades like this, and you've got a stage up here and a stage down here, you, you always want the stage to be kind of T-shaped. and You always want to push in the middle of the stage um, here, let, I guess let me draw this here, just a, as a little tangent. This is super useful to know because parallel guide mechanisms are used all the time. Okay, so say you have an extruded parallel guide mechanism like, like this. Okay, so that, say that's extruded. These are your blade flexures that are coming out like this, and this is all a big extruded thing. You really want, um, you know, whatever the flexure, no matter how thick or wide or long it is, you always want to go down half the length and push on it the stage there. 
because um, for the very first instant, um, you know, of course, the, the freedom space of this is a pure translation for the first instant. And, and then, of course, over large deformations, it arcs, right? But to access that freedom space, if you actually make a stiffness matrix of this and times it by that pure translation, you'll find it's a pure blue force halfway down the length of the flexures so that when it pushes it, it doesn't induce a rotation. It's like for the first instant, it's, it's a pure translation, and then it, then it starts to arc, right? Um, but the, according to actuation space, you push halfway down. Well, it's, it's this exact same uh, when you have these wires, okay? So, so you'll find, and you can calculate it, um, that, that the T1 will link to W1 halfway down the length of the flexures, and T2 will link to W2 halfway down the length of the flexures, and then omega th or tau T3 will link to omega 3, or <laughs> omega 3, W3, which is a pure moment, okay? Uh, by the way, I never told you um, something very important, <laughs> which is the practical, kind of a practical meaning of what actuation space is. It's actually, um, it's, the, it's the place where you push on it quasi-statically that'll cause um, the, 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 the actual real wire, you know, flexures to produce minimal energy, essentially. Like, it'll stretch them along their axis the least, okay? Um, that, that's one way to think of it. Or, or another way to think of it is it's the center of stiffness of the system. So when, when you do quasi-static loading, so you, you, you don't consider accelerations and velocities, therefore you don't consider damping or mass, um, you're just considering stiffness, um, what this equation finds is, is the, the location where when you push on this, the, the flexures stretch along their axis the least with the minimal energy to actuate this, these, these motions. That's kind of the intuitive thing of what actuation space is. Um, and, um, and it will be the, um, it's the center of stiffness of, of the system. So, Maybe you don't know what center of stiffness is, but maybe you do. Let me let me teach this as well. Okay. You, I hope you learned what center of stiffness is. It's it's very similar to center of mass, but I'm sure if you learned it, you've just learned it in the context of one-dimensional systems. So, say you have a one-dimensional system. Okay, say you have a one-dimensional system here that can only move in one direction, okay? And you've got this like little tiny stiffness K1 and this giant stiffness K2, okay? Well, it turns out, um, uh, you know, say you have a coordinate system here, X and Y, and you want to find the center of stiffness of this, um, you know, so, so that you know the best place to push on it so this doesn't rotate. I know it's a one-dimensional system, and it can't really rotate anyway, but um, but but uh, still, it will rotate if um, if you don't push on it in the right place. Okay, so what you can do is you can, you know, what you do is you find the distance between there, say that's d1, and then you find the distance between there, say that's d2. So you do d1 times k1 plus d2 k2 and divide it by the sum of the two stiffnesses, K1 plus K2. And that will give you a distance from here to the center of stiffness, uh, or it would actually be more over here, right? It would be balanced toward the, the heavier end. Um, right, so, so you would, um, uh, you know, so, so you would find the center of stiffness. It, it's a very similar center of mass. You, the distance to the mass, point masses, uh, add them together, divide it by the mass of the entire thing, and it'll point to the center of mass. This points to the center of stiffness, okay? And what does the center of stiffness mean here? It's where you would want to push on this body so that it, it wouldn't rotate. You know, if you push on the middle, um, this one will, like, rotate this way because this is much more compliant than this one. It'll, like, do it like that if you push on the middle. So if you, you have to do it off-center, push on the center of stiffness so that when you push on it, it... it um, it goes up nice and balanced, right? So essentially, what uh, we're doing here with finding quasi-static actuation space, um, or static actuation space, same thing, 
um, is finding the center of stiffness of a three-dimensional system. It makes a lot more sense. It's kind of confusing to think of center of stiffness for a one-dimensional system. Um, but, but this is kind of what we're doing, right? Well, this is exactly what we're doing. So it's the center of stiffness is where you're pushing on these, okay? And this moment relates to the torque. This moment relates to the rotation, and this force relates to that translation, that, and vice versa, okay? And so, of course, that's the freedom space that linearly combines. That's the, the freedom space, or the actuation space. This has three things in it, and that has three things in it, okay? And you can pick those three, um, three uh, actuators. Now, you, you probably wouldn't have... Uh, you probably wouldn't have a, a pure torque actuator, so you'd probably do, uh, you know, a linear force here, a linear force there, and a linear force there, and that would be nice and spread out and independent, and they'd push on the stage, and everything would be good, okay? And 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 then you could linearly combine. You could do different force magnitudes of those things that you placed, and and depending on what combination of magnitude you would cause this stage to translate or rotate around any of the lines in the freedom space with minimal or no parasitic error, okay? Um, and again, with, quasi, with static actuation space, you can change the shape of the stage all you want. It doesn't change it. So this links to that, okay? Okay, but here's something interesting. What if we actually start actuating this stage with some speed, okay? Say, say I actuated it um, with like a signal of like, like some amplitude times cosine omega t, okay? Um, where omega is the frequency, the speed you're driving it. So say, you're, say you want to sinusoidally drive this with some amplitude. So let's say it's like a centimeter amplitude back and forth with a sinusoidal thing with, with a frequency of omega, where, where basically omega is the speed that you're driving this, okay? Whereas before that, omega was zero. It was just, you know, you just you, you, you give it no speed, and that, that's what it would be. Well, if you drive it with a speed, and you still want to access all the things in the freedom space with that speed, with no parasitic error, then what ends up happening is you end up, I'm just going to give you the answer. I'll show you the math, how I calculate this. But it turns out that this constraint space, as, as you, you know, when it's zero speed, it's right in the middle of the flexures. But if you want to access these at, any, at some increasing speed or frequency, omega, so some sinusoidal thing, a cosine omega t, where there's omega, um, and omega gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the distance from that point down to the plane, okay, starts dropping. This begins at the center of stiffness, but it starts dropping, 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 going further and further down. Okay, and and now it's important to realize that um, uh, when we're dealing with speed, when we're driving things with some frequency that's non-zero, um, you know, there's going to be damping. There's going to be mass. Let's assume there's no damping, though. <laughs> Just you know, because it's it'd be difficult to calculate with damping, and it, it's, you can generally assume flexures are largely no damping, even though of course they do have some. Right, but but let's just say there's mass. We now have to consider the mass because there's going to be an acceleration. Um, and F equals MA, right? And so, um, and so uh, we can't just willy-nilly change the shape of the stage anymore. That's only static actuation space. Um, you can change the shape of the stage, whatever you want. It doesn't change the static actuation space. But now, we, we just need to keep the stage fixed in its shape. And whatever the stage sh sh shape is, um, right, for zero frequencies, it's right. It's the static actuation space. And then for higher frequencies, this plane goes, goes lower. So, so, for instance, if you want 20 radians per second, then it goes up here, and it's going to be some slight distance down. And if you want to drive any of these rotations, these translations, with 20 radians a second sinusoidally, you're going to need to be on all forces or moments on a plane that's that distance down. Now, the interesting thing is, is look, check this out. At some point, as you get approach the natural frequency. So that's the natural frequency of this translation. Remember, the natural frequency in this translation and this translation are the same because it's symmetric. Just forget the bolts in here. Pretend it's perfectly symmetric. The natural frequency is the same, and for this system is 45.71 radians per second. Okay. So the interesting thing is if you want to drive this at its natural frequency, um, the, this plane goes so far down it goes to infinity.
this reaches infinity by the time you're at its natural frequency. Okay? And, and so, it, well, and let me show you the other picture here. This is the force you'd have to do to drive at that frequency to, to achieve the same amplitude. Say, say you're driving it back and forth at some, you know, one centimeter amplitude and you're, you're going at this increasing frequency on both axes here, right? Um, to do that, um, as it gets higher and higher frequencies from zero, not only does the plane go down, but it takes less and less force to drive it over the same range till finally, check it out, you get to the natural frequency. This plane is infinitely far away, assuming you can still push on the stage, which you couldn't, right? Once you go below this, this cutoff thing, you can't push on the stage, but let's pretend you can, okay? Um, and physically you can't, but let's theoretically pretend you can, say it's like some phantom ghost stage we can push on. This is infinitely far away, and the force it would take to drive it is zero, which is, of course, what the definition of a natural frequency is. It's like, you know, like, it, it's, it's basically at what frequency this body will freak out and vibrate anyway with the amplitude, say, one centimeter that we want anyway, with no force on it. Because, and this is, by the way, assuming there's no damping either. We, this is just, this has a mass and this has a stiffness in the, the wires and all the masses in the stage and there's no damping, okay? That, that means once we're driving it at its natural frequency, this thing is infinitely far away and the force is zero. So it's just freaking out without even pushing on it, okay? No force. But then, and by the way, I just absolute value this. Um, I shouldn't have to fit it on this, this plot. Imagine this just keeps going down like that, okay? It doesn't turn directions. It just keeps nice, smoothly going down like that, right? Um, I just absolute valued this plot. These are all positive. These are all supposed to be negative, okay? Um, and, and it's actually somewhat significant, but, but anyway, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Then what happens when you go above the natural frequency is, remember, negative infinity is the same point as positive infinity. So... By the time it reaches the natural frequency, this is at infinity above and below, and then it starts coming from above and settling down at a, a very specific point that's very different than this point. This one's negative 14.5, and this one's negative 7.76. Okay? Um, and of course, it can't actually, nothing can actually push on the stage except from the top to the bottom here. But let's just, again, pretend it can, and see, as this frequency goes above the natural frequency, um, the force is no longer zero, it goes to negative, which means it flips in the opposite sign. Okay, so, so for all the, frequen all the frequencies before the natural frequency, it was a positive force, which means the direction it was moving in, translating in, we're pushing in the same direction. We, we were like, you know, it's, it's one to one kind of thing, right? But then, but then once we got above the natural frequency, we don't need it, you know, at the natural frequency, we didn't need a force. Once we got above the natural frequency, you're pushing it in an opposite direction that it's going. It's now out of phase, 180 degrees. If you do a Bode plot, you find, uh, you know, the magnitude stays one to one, and then, then it just drops off at, at the after the natural frequency. But the phase is like in phase, and then it goes to 180 degrees out of phase. And that's why the math shows the sign goes to negative. It actually goes down, and I just absolute valued it, right? Um, okay, so, so basically once, it's, once this plane goes up, uh, infinity starts coming down, you're actually pushing on the opposite direction that it's moving in. Okay, but then it, it, the interesting thing is it's settled, and it just keeps, you need higher and higher force, um, you know, uh, in the opposite direction to drive at the same amplitude. Um, but then it settles at a different place, as I said. And what is that place? Well, what happens if the frequency is infinite? What if you're driving this thing back at an infinite speed? It will still settle at, at this, this, this place. It basically asymptotically approaches um, uh, you know, negative 7.76, which turns out is the center of mass of the stage. So here's what's really interesting. When you start with zero speed, if it's quasi-static, you don't care about mass at all. It's all about stiffness, so it starts at the center of stiffness. As you get faster and faster and faster, um, of course, the acceleration gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and the displacement matters less and less. So, so, so the um, stiffness stops mattering, and all that matters is the mass. 
So that's why it settles out on the center of mass, okay, which is, you know, some distance not quite as low, right? It's somewhere like, uh, you know, the center of mass of this stage is somewhere around here. So it'll go down and then it'll come back and it'll center on there. And, and of course, if it's driving at infinite speeds, the force goes through the roof, but it's in the opposite direction, okay? So, so that's very interesting. So this thing moves. Um, and this is just one little case study, and I haven't shown you how I calculated these plots or anything, but, but I'm just telling you how this behaves. But here is the thing. Um, if we want to drive this stage um, with all the f motions in the freedom space with minimal or no parasitic error at different speeds, does that mean we have to move our three actuators? So again, if we drive them at quasi-static speeds, Here's the static actuation space. We need three actuators, like maybe one here, one here, one there, and, and that's great. We can, we can keep them mounted there, and we can change their magnitudes to access anything in that freedom space, right? Well, but what if we want to drive the things in the freedom space with no parasitic error, but with, at, at an increasing speed? Well, then should we take those three actuators and, like, move them down? Move them down for each different speed you want? And then at some point... You know, and that's going to take an act, other flexure bearings and actuators to drive those. So it's like not only do you have your actuators, but you've got actuators to drive your actuators, and they've got to move. And then, then the even worse news is, is like there's a whole band of speeds you can't even practically achieve. Once the actuators go below this, there's nothing to push on it, and we can't just extend it because it would actually change all the math. Um, and, you know, and then, and then, so we can't get anything below here and up there until we get back down here. So we could actually start pushing on the stage here, but uh, that just gives you like a band, you know, between like maybe, um, you know, some band between like there. Well, actually, it's zero, right? So it's, a Z, it's defined from zero. So if you draw a line from zero between down to whatever this distance is, we can only achieve, um, nat you know, speeds in that band, which is limited. So, so it's like that would, so, so the question is, my goodness, do we need to have other flexures and other actuators to drive our actuators? And do we just, and can we only achieve what's in the freedom space with a limited uh, speeds within that band? And the answer is no. <laughs> okay? We can do something very clever. Okay? And what, what we can do is realize well, wait a minute. What if we linearly combine each of these planes? in the whole thing, so, so we can capture them all. Because if you, th look, think of it. Think of all the stacked, para remember the constraint space that's a bunch of stacked parallel blue planes? Its freedom space is the translation, right? Just parenthetically. But, so say you've got a bunch of pure force wrenches stacked on parallel blue planes. How many independent things are in that? How many independent pure force wrenches are there? Well, 6 minus 1, translation, equals, um, you know, the freedom space, E equals five. So there's five independent pure force wrenches in a bunch of stacked parallel planes. So imagine if we, say, put three on this plane, you know, one here, one there, and one there, so they don't intersect, they're independent on that plane, and then we put two down here, one there, one there, then we have picked five independent wrenches that lie within these stacked parallel planes, which means we could just keep those actuators locked there, never move them, they're mounted, they're set. And if we give them different magnitude values, we could simulate pushing on the stage as if it were on any, with a force, on any parallel plane, including ones that don't even pass through the stage. So this is really cool. Instead of using three actuators and having to move the actuators up and down to correspond with different speeds, we can just have five fixed actuators, make sure they're independent, make sure they stay on these parallel planes, and then actuate them with force magnitudes that uh, create, you know, linear combination forces that are any force acting as if they're pushing on, on the stage on any plane from positive to negative infinity. Okay? So, so that's really cool. Um, and so what you can do is instead of just considering one plane, you linearly combine all the planes, and this is now the dynamic actuation space. Okay? The dynamic actuation space is the stacked parallel blue planes uh, for this, this particular system, made of this particular material, all these things. Um, and, and it tells you how many actuators you need, in this case five, 
how to place them, the best way to orient them to be independent, and then um, you know, how you'd attach them. This time with dynamic actuation space, you can't change the shape of the stage or everything changes. Okay? And, and so hopefully you can attach them orthogonally. Um, but it'll tell you all the ways you can drive the freedom space at any speed with minimal or no parasitic error. Okay? Um, there's some really interesting things about this I'm going to talk about, but first let me tell you how to find it. Okay? Um, it comes from, we've already proven this equation. Remember, it's, it's basically, this is f equals m x double dot plus k x, but in twist land, um, you know, wrench equals uh, m matrix times t double dot plus k t, right? Uh, but then we plugged in the guess, which is a cosine omega t times, you know, um, uh, t where that's time, times the, ta the, the, the twist, plug in the guess, and you take the double derivative, and you get negative omega squared. This one doesn't need a derivative. You pull it out, and this is just the guess. Um, so this, everything in this parentheses is how you generate, um, is how you dynamically, you know, how you generate dynamic actuation space. So what you can do is just, um, so, so first of all, hopefully, I, I kind of went through that very quickly. Maybe I should, uh, maybe I should show this here. Okay. Okay, so, so ignore what's on the screen here. So, so say, you, so this, you've seen this equation before, right? That's, that's basically the three-dimensional Newton's equation without damping, okay? If you plug in the guess here of A cosine omega t, and there can be a phase in there, it really doesn't matter, um, you know, Plus, you know, here's all your delta theta 1, delta theta 2, delta theta 3, delta t, d1, delta d2, delta d3. You know, this twist, that's your guess. Where that's the magnitude. Plug it in, take the double derivative of this, and then, and, then, and then pull this out. You'll get that equation on the top. So basically what that means is... Um, Say you want a, 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 a particular twist um, at a particular speed. You, you want to know what force you can push on something. You know, you have the mass matrix of this. You have the stiffness matrix of it. Plug it in there, and you can say, okay, say I want to get the rotation about Z uh, in that freedom space. Well, you, you'd write that twist in there. You'd, you'd define it with this global coordinate system. And then and you say, well, what speed do you want to achieve it at? If you want to do quasi-statically, omega is zero, and it's just t times stiffness, right? But if you want it at some speed, you plug it in there, square it, minus times the mass matrix, plus the stiffness matrix, then you times it by that, and it'll tell you the wrench. Okay, so, so you can see how you can plug in any twist from the freedom space and plug in any speed you want to achieve it at, and it'll tell you the, uh, you know, the location orientation of the wrench, uh, where you need to push on that at that speed, to, to get that motion. And this is assuming there's no damping and stuff, right? Um, and, and by the way, this is also assuming, um, this is also assuming uh, that all the transient effects have gone away. Like, um, so, so right, when you, when you start dynamically loading something, um, there's, uh, th there's an, an initial transient response that kind of after time settles out and then, it, and then it continues on. And of course it settles out because of damping, um, but, but then it like settles into something. So, you know, if you sinusoidally load something back and forth, right when you start sinusoidally loading it, there's a transient response on top of the steady state, if you've studied differential equations. And, and that eventually goes away, it's damped out, and you just you keep the steady state. Um, this is the steady state um, solution, right? Um, it, which, you know, so we've made some conflicting uh, assumptions. One, that there's no damping, um, which is a, a pretty good assumption, but if there was no damping, then that transient wouldn't go away. But So the truth is there's very little damping, so the transient always goes away, but you can pretty much ignore the damping to, to find this. So this is a, a really nice approximation. Okay, but, um, but, but anyway, that, that's how you would find it, um, and here's how you'd consider